Thank you, Dan, and good morning, everyone. It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Vincent Tinto, because who hasn't heard of that holy grail of student retention that we call the Tinto model? Dr. Tinto is a distinguished university professor emeritus at Syracuse University and the former chair of the higher education program. He has carried out research and has written extensively on higher education, particularly on student success and the impact of learning communities on student growth and attainment. His book, Leaving College, lays out both a theory and policy perspective on student success that is considered the benchmark by which work on these issues are judged now. His most recent book, Completing College, lays out a framework for institutional access for student success. It also describes the range of programs that have been effective and the types of policies institutions should follow in order to successfully implement programs that are both enduring and also easily scaled up over time. Dr. Tinto has received more awards and recognitions than I have time to list in this introduction. But among the recent are the Council of Educational Opportunity Walter Mason Award, the Council of Independent Colleges Academic Leadership Award, and the National Institute for Staff Development International Leadership Award. Through his more than 50 publications, including books, research reports, and journal articles, Dr. Tinto has demystified the confusing factors, the confounding factors associated with student retention. He has lectured all over the world, in New Zealand, South America, Europe, the Middle East, Australia, South Africa, and now in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vincent Tinto. Well, thank you uh, for the kind and humble introduction. I, I must confess I've heard it before because I wrote that. <laughs> and it, that's largely true, folks. That's why it's so objective. Um, it is a, a pleasure being here. I, I say that in part because it brings back memories, not all the best of memories. Because even though my work has not focused on STEM students, per se, I do know the experience of studying science because in the early 60s, I was going for a doctorate in physics at Rensselaer Polytech Institute of Technology in Troy, New York. Uh, but that was a very different experience. It was very isolating, very remote, um, and not easy. And like a lot of uh, people of my age or generation, I heeded the call to drop in and drop out and join the Peace Corps, where I taught physics in Turkey. So coming back and being invited to speak to you has brought back memories, but also has reminded me and shown me, demonstrated how much things have changed, and all for the better. So uh, though I'm not in the STEMs myself, I am a scientist, though we call it social science. But as opposed to social scientists, I know what theory is like and science is like. Okay. So let me uh, spend some time today trying to describe what we have learned from years of research about what are the things uh, that seem to promote student success, and what are colleges and universities doing successfully? Now, even though the work does not apply to STEM directly, uh, it is pretty clear the issues you face and the issues that universities face for students generally are very much the same in, in large measure. So even though some of the examples through video clips I'll use are not STEM students themselves, you'll, re you'll hear the resonance with students you know and the situations they face. So let me begin by pointing out one of the clear lessons we learn from looking at institutions that have been effective in increasing completion of its students is that they address it by a structured, intentional, and systematic course of action that coordinates the work of people throughout the campus. They do not leave this work to chance. It is not simply the result of good intentions, though, of course, that's a minimum requirement, but of a highly intentional planned course of action with clear goals and strategies that are highly structured and, in fact, provide a good deal of structure for their students and is systematic in seeking to address a range of issues. But as importantly, it coordinates the work of many people across campus. Because too often we see programs on this part of the campus in here but they don't communicate well, so the sum of their work is less than the sum of the parts. 
And that's what institutions do. But fine. But what, they, the, what do they literally do? Well, they say to themselves, as most of us would say and recognize, there are many things that affect student success in any field, STEM included. And the, the dropout rate you have of 60%, is that what Joan, the, uh, jo, Joe Handelsman pointed out, is common through most institutions. Uh, so they say there are many things, but at least we should start, at least we should begin to focus on those aspects of student experience that influence success generally and in STEM, especially in the first two years, over which we already have control. I mean, some control, okay? And what are those things that we have control over? We have control of the environments, the situations which students face when they begin their programs, the degree of support, the people they encounter, and the structures they participate in or do not. And that's where institutions start, on the things that already are the result of their past decisions. They reflect decisions made and remade. And they would often say, well, we can change those decisions. We can change what we do, and they do. And what do they do? Well, they look at the research, not just mine, but many others. In fact, my work springs from a whole community of people discussing the same issues in the 60s, when I was only 10 years old. <laughs> I would like to think. Uh, and they say, look, the research points up four major areas, four major conditions, if you will, situations that affect student success. The first is expectations matter. Students do best in an environment where expectations are clear, consistent, and provided in an accurate, consistent fashion. Remember, a lot of your students, and certainly myself, I was a child of a low-income immigrant family who had no education, virtually none. And like a lot of first-generation students, they don't, have the, they don't come with the cultural capital to understand what college is about, what science may require, and their, their expectations are sometimes unclear or even incorrect or excessive. And that's why so many programs focus on not only orientation, which you do, but on a type of advising which tries to understand the student and make clear what they have to do. Now again, these, these clips I'm going to use are not students in STEM, but the issues are the same. I think that's so, so important because the schools I'm looking into now to transfer to, I have to see what classes I need to take to get to where I need to go. And I, I believe for me anyways, if I didn't sit down and take that time, what's the point? I'd be taking classes that would be irrelevant. I wouldn't use any of the credits. I would be, I mean, it's always good to learn, but when we have a goal, it's like what progress am I making toward that goal? Now, there's several things she says. Uh, I don't have the time. Now, recall, a lot of our students, or like the students I work with through Pell and the TRIO programs, they're low income. And for them, time is money. <laughs> so a lot of students simply don't have the time because they don't have the money to take a long journey. And sometimes, even though you may not advise the students directly, program faculty to, you have to make sure their advising is correct. And it's not always correct. And these students simply need to know. Now, advising takes many forms. But it's important they should be clear what steps they must take to complete the journey upon which they begin. But equally important is high expectations, or high expectations. Look, no one rises to low expectations. You know that. Now, the complexity of this is sometimes students begin without high expectations about the capacity or self-efficacy in science. It's certainly true, as Joe, Joe pointed out, many years ago in women. And not just women. In some cases, expectations may be too high, as Bill Trent points out. It's, don't worry about how many credits you start with. Think about how many credits you need to finish. So in any case, you get this perspective from a student we uh, uh, we interviewed. Again, not a STEM student, but clearly he speaks to some of the same issues about how important expectations is to his sense of efficacy. When I came in, I had several teachers that would tell me at the beginning, the first day in their class, 
you're starting out with an A. Don't lose your A. And that stuck with me. And even when I got in classes where the teacher didn't tell us that, my mind was stuck. I'm starting with an A. And I'm finna fight to keep this A. And when that stuck, uh, I took every semester as a challenge. And then in every class, I'm starting out with an A. And I'm not going to lose yeah. it. Wouldn't I love to have that bling? You know what bling is, right? Oh, no, truly. Now, that might mean, may not be the prototypical science major, <laughs> but the issues are the same. And sometimes students encounter in classrooms, certainly classroom climates, where these expectations are not randomly distributed. And of course, that's an issue that we long concerned ourselves with with women in science. And sometimes expectations are constructed earlier in any case, for students, it matters. It also matters because it relates to the notion of self-efficacy. And we know from work of um, uh, Jim Yeager and his colleague that even early classroom events can shape what you expect of yourself and how important early classroom experiences are. So it's not just being told, it's what you experience in the beginning of a classroom. And we can talk more about that. Expectations matter. But holding high expectations and reaching them are not the same. And that's why, as you only too well know, we need support for our students. All students need some form of support. It's not just those. We all do at certain points in our journey toward completion. I know that story well myself. One form of support, of course, is the academic support we provide. This is sometimes more commonly the case when students enter perhaps with not sufficient skills or skills that are somewhat out of date. So institutions invest in a variety of programs that you know about. They range, like uh, Michigan State does, University of South, uh, Central Florida, and many other institutions, and some are bridge programs. But let me make a point. They're not simply academic support programs. The best of the summer bridge programs are a structure of beginning membership in a scientific community. That is, they're not simply giving you skills, but joining a group of other students with whom you will share the journey and be a member of a community that engages in scientific work. That's the secret of a good summer bridge program. And of course, the point of it is to make sure students begin their journey with sufficient skills to participate as all other students do in their fields of study. And it's often best when it doesn't just end at the end of the summer, but when it continues. Michigan State University is very clear about the need for structured support that continues beyond the summer into the first year and even beyond. That's what we do at Syracuse. But there's other forms of support, of course, that related to helping students succeed in their programs of study once they enter. Now, it's an important thing to recognize that the research in this regard points out that the more closely support is connected to the classrooms and laboratories in which students are seeking to succeed, that is contextualized, the more effective it is. Why? Because the closer the alignment of support to the specific task that student faces, that she encounters to succeed in this laboratory or course, the easier it is for her to apply those skills to that specific problem, succeeding in the course. And that's why we have a range of those contextualized support programs. One of the most common, of course, is supplemental instruction. Cal State University Fullerton, among many others, has SI programs. Now, in the classic mode, it would look like this. That is to say, you have a course, in this case, it, it could be English, it could be physics, it could be math, more likely mathematics. By the way, you know the work of Yuri Treisman, don't you? How many people have heard of Yuri Treisman? Yeah, good. You should all look at that work. It's an extension of the work of um, Carol Twigg. That is, sometimes it's not their skills, it's the way the course is constructed and taught, for sure. Okay. Uh, by the way, Yuri Treisman's at the Dana Center in University of Texas at Austin. You should Google the work. He's doing some important work in mathematics now in, in higher education. Okay. In this strategy, uh, what happens is uh, there are 
associated with any one class. I can't do both at the same time here, folks. Um, uh, the students sit in this class, let's say it's mathematics, let's say it's uh, engineering or introductory physics, or my favorite field, astrophysics. Um, by the way, they're redoing cos Cosmos, you know that? The whole series Cosmos, how exciting is that? I am hooked. I'm really, I'm hooked in that field. It's just, okay. Um, so you, they're sitting in a course, and either it's a condition of being in the course that they know ahead of time in this course they have to be su doing supplemental instruction, or because of early indicators that students need support, they are quote unquote required, encouraged to go to these supplemental units that are typically taught by a peer tutor, a student who had an A in the course before. These tutors, or tutor, works with the instructor so she knows what he is doing class to class. And the whole point of that group is to help students succeed one class at a time in the course. All right? Listen to what this one person says about her experience in an SI program. Well, thankfully, AMP has an SI, uh, the student instructor, uh, in instructor. And what she does is she just, it's a student who previously took the class, aced it, and knows this professor. Oh, sorry. Well, thankfully, AMP has an SI, uh, the student instructor, uh, in instructor. And what she does is she just, it's a student who previously took the class, aced it, and knows this professor, this class. And you get together once a week, twice a week sometimes, and you go over the material that's been discussed in class, and anybody can come to it. And so I got to meet a lot of great people doing that, and we formed our own study group on top of that one just to help us out a little bit more, but it, it has really saved me big time. Several things I want to make note of. One, the research is pretty clear. Courses that have supplemental units, not only this form but other forms, have compared to the same courses with the same contact without them, high grade point averages. Why? Of course, the bottom comes up, all right? Uh, but just as importantly, what she said, I formed a group. Uh, it is pretty clear that these small groups themselves be called small micro communities, within reason now, because students in groups do better than students on their own. And we'll, t we'll continue this theme throughout our conversation today. The groups form groups that are self-sustaining in some way and self-supporting. And that helps them also, not having to deal with the course by oneself. So there's supplemental instruction. Of course, there's also peer tutors, like the STEMMART program, University of South Florida. And you have a lot of that. You, oh, I know, I've looked, I went through your poster sessions, I ran around to the various sessions yesterday afternoon. I came in late from the airport. I was speaking in Indiana, where it was even colder. <laughs> Uh, and those things are good because these are peer tutors who are in the same field who can talk about those courses in a center that is not the same format as SI, but it is SI with the same notion. You help students succeed as they come in with that course, contextualize support. And increasingly there's the potential of adaptive learning, especially that which uses predictive analytics. And you know what adaptive learning strategies are. Students are then engage with a technology typically online, or not necessarily online, and, and the machine, get the computer technology brings students through the subject matter, and every time they respond, it starts adjusting its subsequent questions and responses to suit the student's needs. And it's partly based not only on the student's response patterns, but on a predictive ana analytic model which targets background characteristics and problems that arise. You folks, you, how many people know about predictive analytics? You all should, you're all scientists here, right? How many people shop on Amazon? Now be honest now, Amazon, right, <laughs> iTunes. And what happens when you shop on Amazon? They say, oh, people like you. Well, that's basically predictive analytics, but their interest is only in selling, not helping. Okay, <laughs> iTunes does the same thing. So there's a range of contextualized support. Now, one of the things we know well, uh, is that the other support can occur through the linkage of courses. Now, this is called the link uh, model. It's a learning community involving two courses. In this case, 
Uh, the faculty members, the mathematician and the engineering faculty person, they will collaborate so that one in mathematics may use engineering models to use mathematics and vice versa. That's another type of support. Now, I'm going to give you a quote from a person we interviewed in a big national study we've done of learning communities. It's not on mathematics, but the principle is the same. You can hear her voice. You know, the relationship between accounting and ESL, English is a second language, this came from New York City. And by the way, it's pronounced New York. You can tell from our British accent, I grew up in New York. I don't talk funny, you talk funny, folks. <laughs> the relationship between accounting and ESL is helping a lot because the accounting professor is teaching us to answer questions in complete sentences, to write better. And we are more motivated to learn vocabulary because it's accounting vocabulary, something we want to learn about anyway. Now, here's a key sentence. I am learning accounting better by learning the accounting language better. That's contextualization through the linking of two courses, not just a study center. And this is also a principle we'll talk about in interdisciplinary learning environments. Okay. So there's that. But of course, not only do students need academic support, more than a few need social support. And so programs have a range of support to give them help, nurture them, or bring them along as they encounter problems that are not just academic, but social. So we have our counselors and advisors. And importantly, we have peer and faculty mentors. Mentor programs matter. Listen to what this one person said. You know, I think that each student, some way, somehow, should be assigned to like a mentor or something. Because sometimes kids do get demotivated and they need a little push and they need the right encouragement and sometimes their friends know they want to help them but they don't don't know exactly what to say mm -hmm. so sometimes i think we do need that mentor to keep us going because we want everybody to be successful in america i know i want to be successful I'll yeah. some cheese. <laughs> but, you know so i think they should consider doing that i interviewed this young man he was a live man he was just alive i just He's so dynamic. I, I, that's why I took the video clip of him, because he was so, he got the point. Now, how many people here have peer mentoring programs here on your campus? It's a wonderful idea. Several things to be aware of. They need to be trained. You know that. This is not something you do just because I, I care about you on a mentor. There are skills of mentoring, and some of you have mentoring training programs, I know. Critically important. But two, they are part of an early warning system. And I'll talk more about that briefly. That is to say, they will often hear about issues that affect students that they will not tell you about, but will tell the peer mentor about. But mentors, are, you shouldn't expect them to resolve those problems. That's why they need a backup system. They need who to call if they hear something. But they'll often alert you before the problem is manifested in a clear way. I can see you nodding. All right. So mentors are important, but they must be trained. Now, one of the virtues, as you know, what he said about the mentor, is that typically these are students who've got an A or doing well in the course, they could be in their junior year by now, and that mentor can say something to you as an advisor that you can't tell the student yourself, because you don't know. That is to say, if I have traveled this path in this place, and I've managed it, I'm gonna tell you how also. And that information is not always at your disposal. It could be, oh, go see that person, not that person. You see? So you have to also they pick your mentors carefully because they become role models for your students. And not all students have role models in their life. And those journeys are not journeys you may understand because you may not have their particular experience, if you know what I mean. Mentors matter. But so do cohort programs and first year learning communities. That is to say, students who share a journey together over a course of time, whether it's the first semester, the first year, or their entire programs, as some colleges do, they do better together. Students on their own are more likely to have more problems than students in groups for a variety of reasons. 
but not random groups now. These are structured groups. How many people have cohort models where students follow the curriculum together? I'm sure we can have stories and things you can share with your colleagues. Number you have learning communities, right? How, raise your hand, who have learning communities? Oh, good. Here is a quote uh, from a person who was in a learning community. Um, now, this is, again, this is the studies we've done that are reflected in these videos and quotes come from a national study of 23 learning communities serving low-income students, because I work with the Pell program. Um, so you'll hear these struggles that may not be typical of your STEM students, but the issues are the same. Now, this was a woman we interviewed who was 37 at the time. She had three children in the home. She had no partner, and she had two jobs. And she had a commute to the college in New York City at night on the subways. Now, if you know the subways like I know the subways, just getting to the college was an achievement. She had difficulty finishing a degree twice before. She started and she stopped. She got into this learning community that was a cohort model. And she thrived and not only finished her degree at the community college, she finished her four-year degree in biomedical science at the City University of New York about three years ago. Listen to what she says. The link class... Oh, oh. Oh, the link. oh, here it is. I'm sorry. This is, I got the order incorrect. Excuse me. In the cluster we knew each other, we were friends. We discussed everything from all the classes. We knew things very, very well because we discussed it all so much. We had discussions about everything, she said. Then she adds this beautiful image. You can say it's a, a metaphor she constructs. It, the cluster, the learning community cohort was like a raft running the rapids of my life. What she discussed is the sort of support that emerged from the shared environment and the shared learning activities, support that occurs in ways that we can't easily provide because we're not there all the time. Support that is sensitive to their per position that other students also have, the sharing of a common journey, if it's implemented correctly, folks. The same thing happens in learning communities for the first year. Now, let me just reaff reaffirm, just restate Joe Handelsman's position. The first year is a critical one. The first two years are critical. The experience you have with most of your students who don't finish, do not finish in the first two years is common across all subjects. And that's why so much of the attention of where we start we saw it in the first year, the first two years. Now here's a person who we interviewed in a learning community on the West Coast. The link class also helps freshmen who are new to the school to build a relationship. And the fact that you see the same people basically in your link classes, you build, you become more comfortable and when you're a new student in a, in, a, in a new school, you sometimes are a little bit apprehensive as to um, being more vocal within your classes. So this way, it, it, it creates a relationship where you feel secure. Secure. You feel open, yeah. where you can discuss and you can share what you learn with the class. Yeah, you hear that? Constructing safe, secure places. For a lot of first year students who come from different places, or may feel ill at ease, or maybe, is this the right place for me? That's an important issue. Safe, secure environment where they can discuss. The same principle applies when we talk about pedagogy in a few minutes, by the way. All right. Of course, a third environment, beyond the environment of expectation support, is an environment that assesses and provides feedback to the student, to you, and other people about what the students are doing because it's not a question of having support as much as it is when support is needed. And there's a variety of assessment and feedback techniques. Adaptive learning is certainly one, and it's only in this infancy for sure. But so too do institutions invest in assessments which lead to early warning systems. How many people have early warning systems in their programs? 
Uh, folks, let me urge you to pay attention to the need for early warning in the key foundational courses in your program. And let me just convey uh, an a important finding of years of complex research about the secret of effective early warning. Let's see if I can do this in simple language. The secret of effective early warning is that it's early. <laughs> no, I'm very serious, folks. Why? We know from studies of patterns and the dynamics of failure and withdrawal that the longer you wait to intercede and provide support to clarify or deal with student struggles, the more difficult it is to succeed in the class. And if you wait, like many institutions do, to the midterm, when they have midterm grades, for many students, it's already too late. So the secret of effective early is early, the first two weeks, ideally. Now, how do you do that? That's the challenge, of course. It's a lot of work. Can you imagine teaching a class of introductory physics at 70 students? And a faculty member has to track each student. Now, there is where technology has helped us. How many people have heard of the Signals Project at Purdue University? Oh, you should look into it. At Purdue, engineering courses, mathematics courses, you name it, they, faculty members, in the first year, I wouldn't say all, but most of them now, they put mini exams, the first two weeks, fourth week, sixth week, eighth week, and they put it on Blackboard in this case. The students take the exams online. Then, given the predictive models they use, they use predictive analytics, they develop a prediction based upon the performance whether the student's gonna have serious trouble, red light, some problems, yellow light, or no problems, green light. Those signals are sent right out to a support person, the faculty person, and the student's told, you have to do something. However, the secret of a success is not being told to do something, but being proactive and reaching out to the student to get them to do something. I can see people nodding back there. Yeah. You have an early warning system? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to do. But technology helps us because it's getting the warning early and getting the response early, triggering response. Now, the same thing happens, by the way, in classroom assessment techniques. You know of the work of Eric Mazur at Harvard with the cl automated clickers? You've heard of that work? What he does, you know what the automated clickers are. He, he stops and says, okay, and now here's a problem. Uh, what's the right answer, A, B, or C, D? And people click. He goes, all right, before we decide on what's the right answer, I want you to form groups and discuss the answer. So he uses click to form group activities, and then they discuss the problem. It's a very nice technique. And he has a video of it. If you go to the Derek Box Center for teaching and learning, there's a video of him using this technique. It's very nice. But you can do the same thing through things like one-minute papers in classrooms. You know those things are? Where you give out to a classroom sheets of paper with no name. They can't have any name. And you ask them to share with you in two sentences things that are unclear. Then you go to your office. You read these documents, a random sample of them. And you respond online, and the next class, you review in the next class what things were unclear. The virtue of that feedback loop, not just the automated clicker, not only does it help students, but it helps you decide and learn about what you're not doing well as a faculty person. So these assessment devices are really a, a, a reciprocal relationship between you and the students trying to construct learning together. You know, as we say in pedagogy, it's not about our teaching, it's about student learning. So often we as faculty have to learn to be more effective. And feedback is feedback to us as well. So assessment, the third situation. And fourth, and not surprisingly, engagement matters. I think I've written about that a bit, ad infinitum, to write about the obvious. You know, I was always struck about why my work seemed to take off. When I, when I finished my books, I thought it was so obvious no one would read it. <sighs> the fact is, students who make personal, valued contact, oh, valued contact, not just any contact, but value contact, where faculty, staff, and students are more likely to succeed than those who do not. Now, I use the term valued because Deborah Carter once pointed out it's not engagement per se that drives success. 
is people, the meaning people take from the engagement that drive success. Because engagement occurs in a climate with subsumed values and orientations. But engagement certainly is better than no engagement, but engagement in a situation where you feel you're a valued member of the community drives success. And sometimes not all those engagements are so rewarding. And which engagement matters most for student success when we measure it by learning, not simply completion? It's active engagement and involvement with other students in the class and learning activities. In class activity, active learning drives success. Surprise, surprise. Now why? Here's another piece of complex theoretical research that us academics love to write about, writing about the obvious. <laughs> Not me, it's my colleagues that have this problem. <laughs> the strongest single predictor of how much students learn in virtually every course, I won't say every course, but most courses, is that is a learning gain over time in the course is the amount of time they spend studying. Yeah. I have to write another book about that one. <clears throat> ah. <clears throat> but what drives the amount of time you spend studying when you understand that studying is not just sitting at the desk by yourself? It's active engagement with other students. And I said it, when it's not defined simply by sitting on the desk by yourself, when you engage intellectually, we're trying to solve problems together. That is studying. And that's why things like active learning strategies work. Here, here's a quote. You know, the more I talk to the people about the class stuff, the homework, the test, the more I'm actually learning. Good, right? Good. And the more I learn not only about other people, but also about the subject, because my brain is getting more. Because I'm getting more involved with other students in the class. Now just stop for a second. You see the, how he equates social engagement with engagement here? That's what happens, especially among the traditional 18-year-olds, because they're not only involved intellectually, they have a social issue. They want to become socially identified. And that social engagement is often a way of driving activities beyond the classroom. And then he adds, I'm getting more involved with class after class. Now, I interviewed this young man. I mean, he's, um, uh, I can't remember. His name, I think, was Pedro. I can't remember anymore. And I said to Pedro, Pedro, class finishes at 2.40. Oh, no, Tinto. Class goes on. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, oh, no. What he meant, and we asked him, just tell me what happens. Describe to me. Oh, we walk out together, go to the bus stop. And as best we can, we talk about the assignments. I actually observed them coming to class before the door was opened, and they sit in the hallway working on their assignments. Why? Because they did it together. That is studying. Surprise, surprise. And that's why faculty are now moving toward active pedagogies. Cooperative learning. Tennessee Tech does that problem or project-based learning, like University of South Florida and many others. Now, I'll make a point. Cooperative learning is not, group work is not cooperative learning. Just telling four students to work together on a project, and that's all you tell them, that's not cooperative teaching. How many people do cooperative teaching strategies in your classroom? Look into it, folks. It requires a highly organized, structured form of cooperation and participation where people play concrete roles, they evaluate each other, they have certain tasks within the group work, and you have to monitor all that. And it's a lot of work, oh, I know, especially online. Oh, it's, it's, it's a quagmire online, and we can talk about that. But the virtue of project-based learning as a group work, it's application. Application, as they do at Syracuse University and University of South Florida and many other places, it's application that drives real learning. That's why laboratories work when they're contextualized. But so too in science does being part of a developmental engagement in research. Now, I say developmental engagement because students, if you know student development theory, there's a developmental sequence where you scaffold over time increasingly more complex tasks. And any person who's taught, how many people have taught project-based learning here? 
Well, I, I've done that for years. And as you know, when you have class students who come in who haven't done this before, you can't expect them to go right to a major project. So you scaffold developmentally small little mini projects so they develop more sense of power and efficacy. They learn by cooperation. They learn some critical thinking skills and you can expand the project over time. The same thing in a research career as an undergraduate. Not only do you need mentorship and participation in research, but you have to scaffold it. So it's a developmental sequence. You're becoming a scientist. And of course, there's also, in my view, the most powerful of all these pedagogies. It's learning communities that are interdisciplinary, like that at Morgan State, at Sonoma State. That is, not only when students study together, but they study the subjects together in ways that cross the borders of the subjects themselves. Um, my link courses were student development, English 12, and sociology. Not the science. student development was sort of like just a jump start to your college career and how you can excel in the other two link courses. So for homework assignments, when we had major, pa major papers to write, the English paper and the sociology paper would combine and they would become joint assignments and it would become huge chunks of our grade. And it was great because everything really correlated as far as just the lesson plans for all three classes. So sociology, we talk about just social location, why society is the way it is, and then we're talking in English, we're reading Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, which fit perfectly into what we were talking about in our soci so so sociology class. And the papers were just regular English papers, but we had to use sociological okay. terms and how everything just correlated with the book. And okay, you get the point. For example, at Sonoma State in beautiful California, I now live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Having retired from Syracuse University, I had enough snow to last me a long time. So uh, they have a, pro a learning community, and there's many like these. It's called the Watershed Project. And what they do is combine biology, ecology, uh, critical thinking skills, calculus for modeling, with a laboratory, and the laboratory is applied in the field. It's dynamite stuff. You know the research. Students may remember 5% of what they hear, maybe 10% of what they read, but much of what they do. And that's why a laboratory is so important part of a linkage of a learning community, as they do in Sonoma State. Okay, fine. But knowing and I'm almost finished, folks. Bear with me, and then we'll have a chance to have a conversation, a one-minute paper in this audience. Knowing what works is not the same of knowing how to make what works work. Um, implementation is everything, folks. So let me just spend a minute sharing with you what we've learned about implementation strategies that some of you who have done it well understand. One. You need to read about what's going on, identify a project, and visit them, and learn from them. And when you visit a place or talk to a person about their project, do not just ask them what they do. Ask them how they got to do what they're doing now. That's what you want to learn. Strategies implementation. Understand, however, that those strategies are always contextualized to a specific context. So whatever you learn about how they've done it, you have to plan for adjustments in your context. It's unavoidable. And that means part of the implementation process is building in a type of assessment that we call formative assessment, not summative, what gives you information that gives you feedback about how you must change it in this context. So all good implementation has a period of adjustment. It's unavoidable. It takes time to get these things right. No matter how serious, how dedicated, and how knowledgeable you are, things differ. And that is why, and I'll read this briefly, you have to understand that though some administrators may think outcome and time change is a linear graph, it is not. It's a sigmoidal curve, you know, Harry Sigmoid, the Della contestant down the street. <laughs> That's what most plots of innovation, success, and growth look like. 
In fact, by the way, if you do studies of when compulsory education laws were passed in the United States, they did not occur here, they occurred here. In the middle, but it doesn't a story. Because these compulsory laws were not intended to get people to go. They were designed to get people who weren't going to go. Okay. Now, therefore, no matter how much you read, you're going to find the first period of that is initial implementation, and you'll say to yourself, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, we overlooked that. Gee, I didn't realize that. No matter how much you read, you're going to discover there are things you didn't think of or things you have to change. That is the nature of things. It's not your fault, folks. It is the way things work. And that's why a second stage, it may take in the second year, not the first year, you do formative assessments, you start adjusting. Then eventually, you get to what's called the tipping point of a program. It's going, ah, got it. And that's what we mean by the tipping point. Now, it's a little different from the book tipping point, but it's the same notion. It takes time to get there. Now, why do I say that? Because sometimes we face budgets or project directors or offices in Washington who look at costs and benefits as year to year. They're not. Costs are here, benefits are here. They're delayed. And you have to make sure the people who you report to understand that is the nature of things, not your doing. It simply takes time, implementation. And finally, and I'll stop, it's one thing to begin a program, it's another to see it endure over time. One of the uh, sad events for most programs, not just STEM, but of course many issues across campuses, you see programs start, they're remarkable, they stop. Sometimes funding runs out, sometimes the people running it get tired or leave, it dies. There's little point in starting a program if it doesn't continue. So, briefly, the people at Central Oklahoma talked about this last night. People at uh, Western Michigan talked about this as well. Several points. One, you need to be aware that in order to sustain yourself, you have to have evidence to document the fact it's worth sustaining. Simple as that. Evidence matters. Now, understand the evidence that you provide to one group like the administration will not be the same evidence you apply to faculty. <laughs> no, very different evidence. And it's delivered in different qualitative data versus quantitative data, and who delivers it? If you want to convince other faculty to support your program, who should deliver it, you or other faculty? Okay, you know that. So you need data, and you therefore have to use it to build support for the administration you need to make sure they understand how it aligns with their goals, how it is part and parcel of their mission, so the item becomes not an add-on, becomes sort of a line budget item. That's your goal, to generate revenue as a continuing part of institutional function, not an add-on or supplemental. That's the goal. But as importantly, you need to plan for your replacement. At the very outset of a program, folks, please start thinking about who will replace me when I get tired and stop. I've seen too many programs start, the person gets tired, stop, and there's no replacement, it dies. Now that's not to say you are not important, but your role is to make sure people continue beyond you. And finally, to do that, folks, you have to concede there is no pure one way of doing it. If you expect someone to take over for you, you have to give her or him their voice in constructing how it's operated. So you cannot be pure. Of course, purity will often constrain continuation. Okay. Final thought. These things are achievable, but they take time and effort. That's the nature of things. So please, folks, stay the course. And when the going gets tough, and it will, Talk to each other across the country. Form your groups. Build a cohort of support. Remember, as it gets hard, it's not about you. It's about your students. Because their future is our future. Thank you.
Now it's time for a one-minute paper. We're going to do a feedback loop here, okay? And this is what we're going to do. In fact, I don't want to stand up here. Could I just go downstairs here? I don't like being on a podium. I, I just rather be in the crowd. I'm from New York. We like crowds. Uh, in fact, I spent eight years on the subways. I went four years to Brooklyn Technical High School. I don't know if New York City, it took, it took me an hour each way on the subways. You went to Brooklyn Tech? You know it. And then I spent four years on the subways going to Fordham University, a Jesuit university, which explains why I'm not Catholic anymore. <laughs> uh, that's an inside joke, folks. You have to understand. Okay. Now, here's, the, here's what I want you all to do, folks. Can you all hear me back there? Good, good. Uh, I want you to form groups as you can. Move your chairs or sit around. Move your, on your seats. Form groups of two or three is best. If not, four is fine. Whatever. Each going to run a, a, a version of a one-minute paper. It's called the muddiest point. Or, right, and you're going to hear, before you talk to anyone in your group, you're going to ask yourself two questions. Is there some issue I want to uh, speak to or agree or disagree with? Or give examples. More importantly, is there some point where uh, what Vincent said was not clear. By the way, I don't use Dr. Tinto, folks. My name is Vincent or Vinny or Yo, Vinny. Why? I only use Dr. Tinto when I'm trying to get an appointment with the doctor's office. <laughs> no, you know how this works, folks, right? Okay. okay. You say to yourself, okay, it's something unclear. Then you share your one-minute papers, take no more than 15 seconds each, say, I'm, I want to talk about this, I'm confused about this, or unclear about this. Then in your group, nominate one issue you want to speak to or one question, right? This is a version of Eric Mazor's work, right? Then you're going to, as best I can, I'm going to go around the room and ask the group to offer a question or an issue. Then together, we'll try to answer those questions together. Okay, you get it? So let's do this for 10 minutes first, and then we'll have a conversation. Let's go. You know, it's just, it's just lovely that we have a chance to talk to each other. Uh, and that's one of the virtues of what I call blended classrooms. Um, I've done work online, and it's hard work, I mean. But when you blend the classroom face-to-face -face and online, you allow a multiple set of conversations to occur. And I really encourage you to keep this conversation going. Get names of people. You know, talk to each other. And when you have a struggle, Email. In fact, th these are wonderful listener learning communities, for example. The ancient learning communities, by the way, uh, go to Evergreen State College, Evergreen State College, and just Google learning communities. It's called the Washington Center for Learning Communities. They do a variety of things to support learning communities around the nation. One of it is a listserv. Very simple. You pose a question, and you get answers from all over the country, in other parts of the world, Australia, New England, uh, New England, you might construct a listserv for yourselves. It's a shared conversation, so you raise questions, so you can talk to each other. Okay, in any case, uh, who, which group would like to start with a comment or a question? Could someone stand up and I'll repeat it? Some brave soul? Okay, I didn't get you. Okay, let me walk over. And you can speak it into this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Cindy First, University of Utah. And I'm a very big proponent of the flipped classroom. Use it myself extensively. OK. So in the process of helping faculty be able to help the students, if you have a freshman class, physics, math, electrical engineering, whatever, you probably have six or eight faculty that are teaching your freshmen at any given time. These faculty are probably pretty bought in. But how can I best help them be able to set up early warning systems in their class without it being really crippling to them? In other words, how can I help my faculty change their behavior? Can I have a question I can answer? <laughs> you know, the irony of this, I'm, I'm going to reply to that, of course. Uh, the irony of this is, you know, this, I'll speak for myself. I have a PhD from University of Chicago. Not a bad graduate school. Yeah. Uh, what did I learn about teaching methods? Zero. What did I learn about assessment techniques and feedback? Zero. What about a curriculum? And structure, zero. What qualifies me to teach? I'm a PhD, man. No, the point is, all of us are in the same situation. We have been, as a function of the practice from which we spring, not empowered to help our students learn. 
I wouldn't say not all of them. You know what I mean? They're wonderful, gifted faculty. Please don't get me wrong. But as a matter of practice, we're not trained. So how do you get faculty to develop these skills? Well, you need a faculty development program. Those programs are best run not by an outsider, however debonair, but by other faculty in the institution. You'll have faculty who know this stuff, who know cooperative teaching, who know project-based learning, who know about early warning systems. You start by identifying two or three other faculty in the first year. You need incentive from the institution, and you host a meeting, and they model. It's like being a peer mentor, but you need evidence, all right? And it takes time because you're essentially building up over time a larger and larger sample of faculty who acquire the skills. And then it becomes a sort of a critical mass. And once you get enough faculty, then it becomes more like a norm, not the exception. But it takes time. But you need support from the institution. And therefore you say, why does it matter? You need evidence. This helps. Yeah. Um, of course, technology will also help because some of the work, for example, early warning systems, is so much work. Anybody want to comment on that? It's true, not only of SI, but all range of skills, like how to do cooperative teaching, how to run uh, project-based learning. It's the same issue. How do we slowly expand the skill base of faculty? And it's not the faculty's fault. We just spring from a, a medieval system of training. Now, I'm not talking about myself. I'm gifted. It's my colleagues that have this. <laughs> Okay, another question or comment? Someone else? Yes, please. Your name and where are you from? Thank you, Tama White with Sage Fox Consulting, external evaluators. Um, so our team came up with a very similar question, I think you started touching on it, was how to link student success to faculty success more closely. We're talking about the TMP process, of course, right? It's come up in several workshops. Um, and also from even high school and beyond, so at multiple levels, we're talking about faculty relationships with supervisors, faculty with students, students at the high school, all these different stages. It's like how does their success link to our success? So. Well, you people have hard questions. Uh, well, you know the issue, I mean, clearly one issue is if promotion and tenure doesn't support teaching, what do you expect the person, to, you know, to endanger their career? So we see in, in many universities, young faculty, particularly the ones come, they're dedicated, they're motivated, but as they approach promotion and tenure, they say, oh, I, I can't do this anymore, I have to get. Uh, What's interesting, of course, is now that states are having accountability systems, you've been following this work, right, folks? There are now 25 different states in the country that are now shifting the funding formula for public universities to put at least portion of the funding based upon outcome measures, not surprising one of which is completion. The state of Tennessee has gone whole hog. Who's from Tennessee here? You know this, right, folks? The total budget is a function of certain range of outcomes, however fairly measured or unfairly measured. Now, once that happened, there's an institutional consequence for not improving success. And once that consequence is filtered down to departments, people unavoidably, for self-interest only, need to change a bit. And we're seeing that slowly. I was in Tennessee last week, and people are interested. Now, the question is whether that interest will lead to support for faculty to valuing that work in ways that affects promotion and tenure. But without consequence, who's going to change? So it's not a matter of good intentions. It's a matter of there has to be some consequence that the institution feels to give you the support you need to do that work so you don't endanger your career by doing what matters for students and for the institution. That's what I meant by sustaining, by aligning to institutional mission. So in some states that have accountability, those data can be very telling. Yes, sir, someone had a comment here? Just a comment that at many, at many liberal arts colleges, teaching is an important, teaching effectiveness is an important yeah. part of promotion and tenure. It is because their revenue depends on completion. That, that's a consequence. <laughs> Okay, one last question, folks, and then we have to end. Any comment? Oh, yes, madam. Did someone else have, you had a question too, sir? Okay, two questions, please. My name is Susan Shadle. I'm at Boise State University. Um, we talked about how at the start you talked about the, that schools that do this successfully 
kind of integrate all these things across and, and do, do all these things intentionally. And we talked about the challenge of um, how, how to actually do the integration. So we, had, we could list lots of programs at our institutions that were working in their little slice of the world, but not necessarily highly coordinated. Okay. You heard the question. Would someone like to respond to that? Because I know some of you have these structured, coordinated programs. How many people from Michigan State? Are you here? Michigan State folks? We're here. We've got this oh, you had the question. <laughs> Well, I see our time is up, folks. We have to, uh... <laughs> Look, there's a saying about this. Perfection's the enemy of the good. You'll never have perfection. The reason why structure matters is students do better in structure. You know, I have a good friend of mine, uh, Kay McClenney, who's just retired from leading a big research center at University of Texas. And she says often, students should not do optional. Why? If you have good evidence to believe or document that doing certain things helps students, why would you lead them to choose to do it or not? And that's the underlying notion of structure. Uh, now, structure is not easy to achieve, and you ask yourself, where is it easiest to achieve for students? First year. Because often the first year, students are not fully engaged in an individual program. There are a lot of courses that are generic to the first year. So you see these programs that have high structure, like learning communities, like cohort models in the first year. And of course, it's understandable you want to do them in the first year, as Joe Handelsman pointed out. That's when most of the attrition occurs. So you, you have the low-hanging fruit, you address it right at the beginning. So it's there you see most structure. Now, how do you coordinate? Uh, for retention programs generally for an institution, what you tend to do, and we've done it at Syracuse for quite a few years, you establish an office on student success. And you start with a committee representing all the key players that have shaped student experience on campus. It could be residential life, it could be financial aid, right? It could be support systems. And you bring together and you develop as a collegial group, you come to some agreement over a year about how we coordinate our work so we all work together in some systematic way. It takes time to build collaboration. It's a collaborative process. And that's part of what you mean by structure. Huh? But perfection is the enemy of the good folks. There's never, and if you ask the question of me, <laughs> okay. One last question, sir, and we have to stop. By the way, you have a good beard. It's good looking on you, sir. Thank you. I'm Phil Sadler from Harvard. So uh, on average, STEM students are more introverted than average, than average students. And so, um, is that <laughs> not in this room. <laughs> so, so they're often resistant to reaching out to other people for support or should they, they think it shows weakness. So what do you do to break that, that way of thinking? What do you do? What do I do? <laughs> well, in, in, in my classes, I guess I meet with students in small groups so I can know what's going on with them. Okay. Who also wants to respond? I'm going to respond to that before we just finish. Anybody want to respond to that question? <laughs> well, let me give you the analogy. I do project-based learning, and students have to work in groups. I don't let them self-select themselves, by the way. Otherwise, self-selection could destroy a classroom if you're not careful, depending on the classroom itself. I assign them, but in different ways. I, more than once, I'll have a student come to me saying, look, I didn't come to this group work. I, wanna, I do better on my own. I say, sorry, not here. Here, we work together because in the real world, you must work together with other people. Yeah, as a scientist, you work by yourself in laboratory, but science arises from collaborative shared learning environments, especially interdisciplinary ones. So I don't give it for them to choose. So therefore, I construct, but I also try to construct the environment where they come to appreciate why involvement with others matters. That's why I'm so careful with the group formation. Because sometimes they don't have the experience to understand why being a shared group member values. I don't discourage individual work, but I don't want them to isolate themselves individually. Because as I said in these quotes, support arises 
from group work if you construct the group correctly. And that's the challenge, right? If you solve the problem, write a book and I'll buy it from you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, folks. We'll talk more later on. <laughs>